stand before the throne and Christ alone is the cornerstone in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Thank the Lord for his grace and mercy. Thank him for the breath of life. Thank him for each and every one of us to be found here this day. Thank him for the ability to wake up this morning and even breathe. That itself is a testimony. I thank the Lord for all that he has done. Why you went astray 
there's no place left for pride it isn't what you do but a gift was given me that's here for you I know who I am and I know where I'm going I know why I'm here why I'm here with you Why the earth goes around I know where the answer's found I know love's forever And I know that it's true I know love's forever And I know that it's true Greetings to all the wonderful name of Jesus. I give you to my word, so Lord, consider my meditation and hearken unto the voice of my cry my King and my God for I to thee will I pray my voice shall thou hear in the morning Lord in the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee will I look up give you to my word Oh Lord, consider my meditation and hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For run to thee will I pray My voice shall I hear in the morning And Lord in the morning Will I direct my prayer unto thee Will I Look up, give you to my word, O oh Lord. Consider my meditation and hearken unto the voice of my cry. My King and my God For run 
to thee will I pray. My voice shall I hear in the morning. Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee. Will I look up? Greet you all in the lovely name of Jesus Christ. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful this day, my God, that we can gather in your divine presence, Lord. You are the God that has watched over our lives, Lord. You see every heart, you see every mind, my God. Lord, you see the vessels of clay that have gathered together, my God. Lord, I pray that you'll cover this place under the blood of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, for those that are not here, my God, wherever they can be, I pray that you'll draw them to your presence, my God. Lord, we are dependent upon thee to give us the inspiration of your word, my God. Take our minds, Lord. Father, our vessels of clay, dear God, inspire it, my God. Let something be said, Lord, that will be beneficial to your children, my God. We ask these mercies in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning, my brothers and sisters. Uh, I realize the weather conditions were severe yesterday, and uh, but it just bear with my voice this morning. I pray that the Lord will just give us the grace to go through this service. We're going to go to our first slide this morning. We're going to turn in the book of uh, Genesis in chapter 3 and verses 15. We're entitling our message this morning, The Promised Seed of the Woman. Now my brothers and sisters, uh, 
we realize that uh, to the world, my brothers and sisters, uh, this is uh, a season that uh, they no doubt look upon the birth of Christ. And uh, we realize, my brothers and sisters, uh, that uh, this is a season that should really make every Christian uh, ever join their heart because uh, Jesus Christ was born. As much as he was not born on this 25th of December, but my brothers and sisters, we know that he was born sometime in September, October. But uh, we're not going to go into that this morning. But uh, we want to concentrate on the fact that if it wasn't for the seed of this woman, my brothers and sisters, uh, we would have had no plan of salvation uh, available for us. Now, uh, we look here in the book of Genesis this morning. And verses 15... It says, and I will put enmity <laughs> between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now my brothers and sisters, uh, you know, as you watch on television, and uh, hear the messages on radio, brothers and sisters, and sometimes uh, you thank the Lord uh, for what they say, but at other times, uh, when they say certain things, you want to scream out and be able to say, get back to the word of God. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, uh, most of the men that you hear preach today will say that uh, God was born in Bethlehem. Now, my brothers and sisters, I realize uh, it's because of the theological seminary institutions that my brothers and sisters have given to them a thought that my brothers and sisters, the little baby that was born in Bethlehem <laughs> was God uh, that was uh, manifested in the flesh. But we know, my brothers and sisters, uh, that God cannot be born because God is eternal. Amen. Now you either do away with the word eternal if you say God was born Amen. and God cannot die. <laughs> so we, we realize that the baby that was born in Bethlehem was not God. It was the Son of God. Amen. And my brothers and sisters, so every time I heard one of these ministers, uh, heard one of these ministers say that God was born, I just thought, Lord, uh, I pray and hope that uh, I could say something uh, to them, but I realize uh, I'm not on their platform and I will not be able to say something to them. But brothers and sisters, I don't condemn them. I don't feel any animosity to the religious world at large. But I am so thankful that God in this hour has given us a clarity of picture. Because brothers and sisters, that is what rejoices our heart. It's to have a clear picture about your God. And to know what your God did in providing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because we needed a savior, brothers and sisters, uh, and if God couldn't die, we wouldn't have had a savior. But because God is who he is, and he is eternal, he can provide a savior through Jesus Christ. So, brothers and sisters, uh, as we look at this, we see that in the Old Testament, my brothers and sisters, there were many prophecies concerning the birth of Jesus Christ. And my brothers and sisters, uh, we realize uh, that this prophecy that we read here in Genesis 3.15, this is the first prophecy concerning the coming Savior, the Messiah. My brothers and sisters, prior to that, there is no word concerning a coming Messiah or coming uh, Savior, I would say. And uh, we know in the book of Amos, it says that God does not do anything until he reveals it to his prophets <coughs> and, and his servants. But my brothers and sisters, in the Garden of Eden, it was God who spoke directly, my brothers and sisters, uh, to Adam and Eve. And that's what we read, brothers and sisters, uh, in Genesis 3.15 And I will put enmity between thee 
and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and, <coughs> and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now my brothers and sisters, this is the first prophecy that is in the scriptures concerning my brothers and sisters uh, a seed that was going to come. This seed that was going to come, my brothers and sisters, was going to come uh, through a woman. Now we know, brothers and sisters, uh, biologically, no woman as a seed. A woman as an egg, as uh, we know, brothers and sisters, uh, but the scripture said, uh, I will put uh, enmity between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In order for, I would say, that woman that would, in time, be the one that would be the incubator to bring Jesus Christ to have a seed, God would have to have provided that seed. So we see, brothers and sisters, uh, this was a long-range prophecy. It was the first prophecy in the scriptures concerning your Savior, my brothers and sisters, and my Savior that will come into this world. So this is a very important prophecy after the fall of Adam and Eve. Now, my brothers and sisters, at that time, maybe Adam and Eve never realized what it really meant. But my brothers and sisters, in God's mind, he saw down in time, he saw a young maiden that was a virgin, brothers and sisters, that would say, be it unto me, and God would place the seed of life inside a womb, and I would say, an egg, that will bring forth, brothers and sisters, uh, the embryo that will lead to a fetus and then bring about the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So, now my brothers and sisters, from Genesis 3.15, we see that God gave many other scriptures, but we're not dealing with all of them. But we're going to turn in the book of Isaiah, <coughs> chapter 7. And verses 14. Now my brothers and sisters, uh, <clears throat> the Lord spoke this to the king at that hour of time. In verses 10, it said, Moreover the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God, ask it either in depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Yea, yea, now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? <clears throat> Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And my brothers and sisters, this is the scripture that the religious world uses to say that God was born in Bethlehem. Because uh, Emmanuel means, uh, brothers and sisters, God with us. And my brothers and sisters, <coughs> we realize this is a scripture that the baby that was going to be born would have the potential that when he reaches about 30 years of age, that God himself will incarnate him and through him it will be God with us but not at his birth so it says therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign <clears throat> behold a virgin shall conceive now my brothers and sisters that was a sign because we know brothers and sisters uh, it's a virtual impossibility for any young virgin girl to bring forth a baby still being a virgin so, brothers and sisters, uh, God was going to do a supernatural work that while she was still a virgin, he would uh, allow conception to take place and uh, that little embryo, that fetus would be born, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, conceived uh, in uh, the womb of Mary. Now, my brothers and sisters, uh, we realize that if this was the only scripture 
then there's nothing to enlarge in this in our mind. To see, well, who was born in Bethlehem? Was it God or was it the Son of God? <coughs> now, as I said, uh, we're not taking all the scriptures. But we know, brothers and sisters, uh, almost 2,000 years ago, a young maiden was visited by Gabriel and spoke words, brothers and sisters, to her and said uh, that, brothers and sisters, that <coughs> baby that was going to be born in a womb was going to be something that, brothers and sisters, going to be conceived uh, by the Holy Ghost. When we look at this, we realize, brothers and sisters, she did not doubt the word of God. She said, be it unto me according to thy word. Brothers and sisters, any other, I would say, young girl would have said, that's an impossibility. It cannot happen. It cannot take place. But my brothers and sisters, Mary believed the word of God. And she said, be it unto me, brothers and sisters, according to thy word. Now we know, brothers and sisters, the story behind how there was no room in the inn and the baby was born and Joseph had not known Mary as the scripture says uh, it was the Lord uh, placing uh, a gem of life in the womb of Mary brothers and sisters uh, and an egg uh, and the due cause of conception took place uh, and that brought forth the Lord Jesus Christ now my brothers and sisters when we turn to Isaiah 9 and chapter 6 uh, verse 6 Again, the religious world, brothers and sisters, have used uh, these scriptures as pet scriptures. And uh, every Christmas comes, <coughs> they will use these verses of scriptures uh, again and again. But how come the brothers and sisters, uh, the religious order of that day, could not really predict where Jesus Christ was going to be born and when he was born brothers and sisters uh, they had missed his birth though they knew in the scriptures uh, where he was born brothers and sisters you know the story that when uh, Herod began to ask the religious people where is this Jesus going to be born they said it is written in the scriptures uh, they said in Bethlehem it's written in Micah chapter 3 you'll be born there but Jesus Christ was already about two years old and they did not know he was born. How come they did not know it? Now my brothers and sisters, uh, <clears throat> even in this generation of time that is awaiting the second coming of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, uh, can it be that Gentile mankind will miss it the same way? Because brothers and sisters, uh, when we look in the first coming of Christ, there were so many scriptures there, but the people failed to interpret what the meaning of the scriptures were. They only knew isolated scriptures, uh, but they had their own interpretations of it. Likewise, look at it in 2019. Ask anyone in this world, where do you think we live in time, in the religious world? Brothers and sisters, in their mind, they have a certain picture, but it is all confused. Uh, they say concerning uh, this about the garden, it's a mystery. We can understand a certain framework of it, but we cannot understand more than that. If you ask the people uh, in, in the message, uh, what is this two days? Uh, many of them don't even understand what the two days are. You ask the people, some of them in Brother Jackson's teachings, uh, they will not know how to explain that. Now my brothers and sisters, I can go on and on and on. My point is, religious mankind is in a similar confusion as it was at the first coming of Christ. And my brothers and sisters, the scriptures that they are supposed to have known for their day, brothers and sisters, is as mysterious as it was in that hour. Now I want to show you, brothers and sisters, that this chapter 9 has been opened many a time and this scripture has been read which will go in a moment but if you were living in Jesus' hour at the first coming of Christ through the word of God you should have had a yardstick 
of time. Because Daniel gave the yardstick. And my brothers and sisters, uh, that yardstick, yardstick would have been able to predict at least, I would say, uh, to the decade when uh, Jesus Christ was going to be born. How come none of the religious order of that day could have been able to place time-wise where he was going to be born or what period of time? Because that is why God had to go outside the religious body. He had to choose uh, three men, or how many men it was, brothers and sisters <laughs> from the east. How come that they were able to come into Jerusalem and say, where is he that is born king of the Jews? How come they that were not carrying the scrolls, they were not carrying the Torah, they were not carrying all of the religious people of that hour, but yet they said, uh, where is he that was born? Because they knew that brothers and sisters, he had already been born. Brothers and sisters, uh, they did not know that. But I'm reading chapter 9 of Isaiah to show you, brothers and sisters, uh, from a yardstick point of view, they should have more or less known, brothers and sisters, uh, the hour that he was going to be able to come on the scene. Where he was going to be born was already written in the book of Micah chapter 3. Brothers and sisters, thou Bethlehem. They should have known he was going to be born in Bethlehem. If they missed that, they could have known where his ministry was going to start. Now my brothers and sisters, while well, you say, well, I, 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 I didn't see that. But let's look in Isaiah chapter 9. It says, nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in a vexation. Now I realize when you were almost, I would say, 2,700 years ago, if you read that, you may say, well, I don't fully understand what that meaning is. <coughs> Excuse me. When at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun, and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. Now my brothers and sisters, uh, all of that seems like uh, a mystery. We don't understand what that is. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them at the light shined. Now you see, brothers and sisters, uh, how God confuses the wise and the prudent. He puts a scripture concerning the starting of the ministry of Jesus first and then follows it with a scripture that is the birth of Jesus Christ. Because actually chronological wise, verses 1 should have came after verses 9. Because verses 9 says, For unto us a child is born. It is not talking about where his ministry is going to start. But verses 1 tells you where it is. Now brothers and sisters, to verify that, we can turn my brothers and sisters in Matthew. chapter 4. We are all familiar with the story. We'll read from verses 11. It says, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Now my brothers and sisters, to show you that everything about the birth, the life, and the ministry of Jesus Christ was chronologically written in the scriptures. But it was not written like a program that man makes. Because my brothers and sisters, uh, when Jesus had finished being tempted by the devil, the Bible says he heard that John was put into prison. He knew John's ministry was over. His ministry was going to start. He departed into Galilee. 
and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulun and Nef <coughs> Nephtalim. I just read that, brothers and sisters, in, a, in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people would sat in darkness so great light, and to them would sat in the regions and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. Now, my brothers and sisters, I've read the scriptures to show you that. God does not surprise his people. A long before brothers and sisters uh, anything that he will want to do, he already places it in the scripture. And my brothers and sisters, when the time comes uh, and the man that is anointed to fulfill that, he walks according to the scriptures. Brothers and sisters, uh, it doesn't tell you that Jesus came and said, you know what, uh, I, I, I saw in, in the book of Isaiah, this is what I'm going to do, that's what I'm going to do. No, but the people of that hour, the apostles of that hour, recognized that scripture. Now my brothers and sisters, look at Gentile mankind sitting today. Brothers and sisters, you can't shift them from John 3.16. They will... Start the Christian walk of life in John 3.16 and forever in their life that is where they'll be. That's a starting point. That's an entrance point. That is where, brothers, your salvation begins. But for you to realize what day you live in, for you to realize how close the coming of the Lord Jesus is, for you to recognize where you are in Scripture, you got to know that every scripture that is written in the word of God, brothers and sisters, will be fulfilled accordingly. If you were living at the first coming of Christ, and my brothers and sisters, uh, you was a dedicated child of God, God would have turned you and said, look at what is written in Isaiah chapter 7 verses 14. Look at what is written in Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 verses 9. Brothers and sisters, uh, that is what I have to say. If they had missed Jesus being born in Bethlehem, they could have said, Lord, what is the next scripture to be fulfilled? God would have showed them that area of Galilee, that area of Zebulun, and that area of Naphtali. They are going to see light come out. And my brothers, from where is the light going to come? There was a child born. For 30 years he walked his life. And he was not going to jump ahead of it. When, when God Almighty will incarnate him. Brothers and sisters. And he heard John the Baptist was now into prison. He comes on the scene my brothers and sisters. And look at the first thing that he says in verses 17. From that time Jesus began to preach. That is light coming forth. And to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at end. My brothers and sisters, that was for the first coming of Christ. What about the second coming of Christ? What, is, what has God done in this hour of time? Brothers and sisters, they had a yardstick. It was Daniel's 70th week. They forgot to use that yardstick. They had scriptures where he would be born. They forgot that. Brothers and sisters, they had scriptures where his ministry would start. They even forgot that. What about our day? We have a yardstick, brothers and sisters. Hosea chapter 6, verses 2. It says, after two days. But how, how do you read the two days? Well, you say it's a mystery. I don't know. The Bible tells us, brothers and sisters, uh, that the Gentile church ages is that yardstick. That is why this is 2019. Next year is going to be 2020. Brothers and sisters, uh, we are now in the final stretch of events. Moving down in time. That's not next month. That's not next year. But hear what I say. We are in the final 
stretch of events. Because remember, brothers and sisters, if God so wonderfully gave a yardstick for the first coming of Christ, point, pinpointed where he was going to be born, pinpointed where his ministry would start. And my brothers and sisters, even he told what animal he would ride before he enters Jerusalem. And all those scriptures, you think for the second coming of Christ, he will just have a blank? That is why I have to say, brothers and sisters, Gentile mankind has gone to sleep in this hour. They refuse to turn in the pages of his word. Because, brothers and sisters, uh, hear the, the ministers on the radio stations today. Well, brothers and sisters, the Bible says uh, that his name shall be called Emmanuel. They don't put all the scriptures together. The Bible tells us, for unto us a child is born. Not God. A child is born. And again I say, if God is born, then he can never be eternal. Because the word eternity or eternal means something that doesn't have a beginning. And my brothers, because they cannot believe that something can be in existence that doesn't have a beginning, so they, somewhere along the line, have to change everything around. But brothers and sisters, we know that God, this child, was never in heaven and came down from heaven and my brothers and sisters <coughs> was incarnated uh, in the womb of Mary. No, he never was in heaven. Brothers and sisters, the only way he was in heaven was as a thought in the mind of his father. And my brothers and sisters, the Bible says uh, unto us a son is given. It doesn't say brothers and sisters uh, well, we don't know whether he was male or female. We don't know God is male or female. It says a male gender. A son is given. It was not dispatched from heaven. It was given to humanity. That's grace. God gave his only begotten son. And my brothers and sisters, the Bible says, And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Brothers and sisters, all of that did not start in Bethlehem. He was, I would say, at the potential that one day as God will co continue to, I would say, invest in him the attributes to be king, to be brothers and sisters, uh, the Mighty cons Counselor in the millennium and that it will go on. So... This scripture is a compacted scripture, but initially it says uh, a child is born <coughs> and a son is given. Brothers and sisters, because the Jews at that hour couldn't see that Jesus had to be a lamb first before he could be a lion. They wanted him to be a lion because he must take over what the Romans have done. But my brothers and sisters, Jesus was born to be the lamb, I would say, to die for the sins of the world. But that doesn't mean after he was a lamb, that God will not invest in him to become the king that will come down and take over this world in the millennium. <clears throat> now my brothers and sisters, just to show you, if we can turn in the book of uh, Proverbs, Chapter 30. Again, the church world will not read these scriptures because they will not be able to answer the question that is in this prophecy. It says the words of Agar, the son of Jacob, even the prophecy. The Bible says it's a prophecy. The man spake unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel and Yukal. Surely I am more brutish than any man, and have not the understanding of a man. Brothers and sisters, this man that is saying this, 
He's saying I'm a stupid. That's what the word brutish is. But he is acknowledging that God can give a prophecy and a word of wisdom. It doesn't matter how foolish you can be. God can use your vessel of clay. He says, I neither, neither lend wisdom <coughs> nor have the knowledge of the most holy. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the winds in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? Look at how many questions are in that verse of scripture. Brothers and sisters, none of us, if God did not reveal to us his characteristics, could answer that questions rightfully. But then he says, what is his name? And what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. Brothers, I like to pose that question to the generation that we live in. It's in the word of God. You, we talk so much about God. But what is his name? Well, you say, brothers and sisters, well, Jehovah. Or we say this, that, and the other. They're too scared to answer it because you would say to the person, the Bible says, go and baptize in the name. So why are you not doing it? But the question is right here. What is his name? And what is his son's name? Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ, when he came into this world, he said, Father, I have manifested thy name. Amen. And then, my brothers and sisters, uh, in Matthew chapter 1, the Bible says that the angel told Joseph and Mary, before he was born, the son that is going to be born, his name is going to be called Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. Brothers and sisters, right here, the question was, what is his name and what is his <coughs> son's name? Brothers and sisters, God Almighty has no other redemptive name but Jesus. Brothers and sisters, that is uh, the redemptive name uh, that he placed uh, in Jesus Christ uh, because that vessel of clay was going to be able to die and pay for the sins of the world. Brothers and sisters, it's God who told the angel to tell Joseph and Mary, you don't choose the name. The name must be called Jesus. And my brothers and sisters, that is why the Bible said here, yeah, this is a prophecy that was in making. And the question was, what is his name? What is his son's name? If <coughs> thou canst tell. Every word of God is pure, is a shield unto them that put the trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he re <coughs> reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Brothers, Gentile mankind has added to the word of God. Brothers and sisters, if not, they won't still baptize in titles. Because uh, any of those titles is not a name. Brothers and sisters, Father is not a name, Son is not a name, Holy Ghost is not a name. That is why right here he said, uh, you can talk about all the rest, uh, brothers and sisters. But he asked a question, what is his name? What is his son's name? And today, with a clear conscience, we can know that our father's redemptive name was Jesus. It was not known in the Old Testament. It was revealed in the New Testament. And he named his son. That's what Jesus could say. Father, I've manifested your name. There was no other name that Jesus manifested but the name Jesus, brothers and sisters, uh, that is why when Peter and Paul and the rest came, uh, they said, by what name do you do this? They said, there's only one name. We do it by the name of Jesus Christ. By what authority you cast these devils out? By the name of Jesus Christ. In my name you shall cast out devils. Uh, in my name uh, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So, brothers and sisters, there's only one name involved. That's the greatest name. You're not saved by any other name but the, the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, and that is why it is of such importance. That baby that was born was named Jesus Christ. Uh, 
And brothers and sisters, you can depend that when you go to the throne of grace, you come in the name of Jesus Christ, it is a name that heaven will respond with. That is why I have to say, brothers and sisters, even Isaiah, when he was going to write about this child that was going to come, he realized the religious world at large will not believe the report. But nonetheless, we can turn there in Isaiah 53. It says, who had believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Brothers and sisters, sir, this report, the brothers and sisters Isaiah was going to write prophetically, the Jews of that hour, they refused to accept it, because they did not want their governor, their king, to be written in such derogative language that my brothers and sisters uh, he was going to be so brutalized he was going to be wounded he was going to be whipped because they didn't want that kind of a savior and religious mankind is the same way today brother take me to a church where there's got flowers everywhere everything is you know so beautiful they want to depend in their salvation on the outward works that came from Cain. Brothers and sisters, uh, Cain never had a revelation. Cain, he said, Abel, why are you wasting your time? Catching a sheep, tying the sheep, and taking a stone to, 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 to bleed it. Surely God is never going to answer you, Cain, uh, Abel. But brothers and sisters, when both of them put their, their sacrifices, one was so beautiful. Cain, my brothers and sisters, he had the best altar. He was religious. He had a, sacri a sacrifice. But Abel, brothers and sisters, he had a more excellent sacrifice. The religious world today, brothers and sisters, uh, that's the same story. They look at the book of Christmas and what do they see? Brothers and sisters, they want to tell the whole world, well, God came down and he was born during Christmas. Brothers and sisters, why? They want to be able to attract mankind. Well, we've got to be reverent and we have to be kind because God was born. God was not born and God can never be born. Brothers and sisters, but God provided for us the only means of our salvation. And my brothers and sisters, that is why we see that Isaiah, after he wrote in Isaiah 7, 14, Isaiah chapter 9, brothers and sisters, he now goes to Isaiah 53. He says, who had believed our report? And to whom is the hour of the Lord revealed? Brothers and sisters, if you have accepted <laughs> Jesus Christ as your Savior, you should count yourself so thankful. Because, brothers and sisters, uh, many of the people of this world have not accepted what Isaiah had written. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Amen. Brothers and sisters, look at this little child that was born in Bethlehem. He never threw a stone and broke anybody's windows. He never slapped another boy for some toy that was stolen. He never had the nature to do that. Brothers and sisters, he said, uh, I was born from above. He did not come from above. His life that was placed in the womb of Mary came directly from God. All our life comes via the law of reproduction. It's earthly. But the life of Jesus Christ came directly from his father. His father took, brothers and sisters, pure human sinless life and placed it in that egg brothers and sisters that he had provided and says for ye shall grow up as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground why is it a root out of dry ground brothers and sisters the re religious mankind they had no other picture 
concerning the coming of this Messiah. Everything, every prophecy was blank. Again, I will say, if they had really followed what Daniel had said, it should not have been dry ground. It should be a living ground. It should have been fruitful. It should have been watered. Brothers and sisters, look at the hour we live in. People will say, God sent a messenger to this age. The seven church age. Look at he preached the church ages. He preached the seals. But have you gone beyond that? Again, people will say, God sent an apostle to this hour. And my brothers and sisters, <coughs> they will still be just where he has brought something. This is 2019. We're going 2020. Brothers and sisters, uh, by now, the church of the living God should have a yardstick concerning the coming of Jesus Christ. And a yardstick that they're not agreeing and shaking their head. It is part of their life. They know that brothers and sisters, the first church age started somewhere around 53 to 57. And brothers and sisters, it's going to end up in this decade that is in front of us. It would not be a mystery to them. They would know that. And they would know, brothers and sisters, there's going to be an event in the Middle East that is going to shake this world. They will know a temple is going to be built. They know there will be an Ezekiel 38 and 39. They will know that a seven seal is going to be broken. That's going to be seven, I would say, seven voices on the scene that will bring a message to the body of Christ. They are not in confusion concerning this. Either they are not unsure and waiting. Well, let's see what God... Brothers and sisters, uh, if Matthew could have been so assured to write concerning what I read in Isaiah chapter 9 and verses 1. You read that, brothers and sisters. Uh, you, you, <coughs> on your own, you will not know where do I place this? That, you know, the scripture. But that apostle of that hour, he placed it in the right place. And that is why, brothers and sisters, in this hour of time, we should realize that God is moving us forward. As a root out of dry ground, he hath no comeliness. <clears throat> and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Amen. How they paint, the Catholic Church paints Mother Mary, our brothers and sisters, uh, try to make her brothers and sisters uh, so loving and so kind and so sympathetic and they raise him her above Jesus Christ because uh, you can't go directly to Jesus you go through the mother first uh, and the mother will talk to the son and then he'll get your prayer answered brothers and sisters that, if it wasn't for truth our minds will be messed the same way religious mankind has done, <laughs> done that down through time but the Bible says Jesus Christ why does the Bible say he had no comeliness? Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ had three and a half years to fulfill a ministry. His schedule, heaven-wise, was tight. Every day of his life, he had to know that his father demanded or his father had something for him. And how can we live in this hour of time, knowing that this is the final decade, and brothers and sisters, uh, people are just coasting. Well, brother, we don't know. We don't know. Brothers and sisters, if Matthew and Paul and the rest said we didn't know, you would not have had, brothers and sisters, the four Gospels written. You take the Bible and read and see how many scriptures this was spoken because it was spoken there. This was spoken because it was spoken there. Amen. Brothers and sisters, and it says, <laughs> and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, <coughs> acquainted with grief, and who hid as it were our faces from him. We dis he was despised and we esteemed him not. Now brothers and sisters, I will assure you, Jesus Christ wasn't of this disposition every day of the three and a half years that we talk about. This is a prophecy of, I would say, the last few hours of the ministry of Jesus Christ. As he's taken from the Garden of Gethsemane into uh, Pilate's courts, <coughs> brothers and sisters to the whipping post, and then finally being put upon Calvary to die for our sins. It was predicted 
or prophesied, I would say 700 years before it could come into being. My brothers and sisters, they didn't want this picture. But the picture was, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. But it says, surely <clears throat> he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Brothers, that is the purpose Jesus came. That is why, brothers and sisters, the little baby that was born in Bethlehem, he was destined to carry our griefs and our sorrows and he was stricken. He was smitten of God and afflicted. Brothers and sisters, it's not an empty, I would say, cross that we have in our mind. There was a purpose that that cross came into being. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Amen. He was bruised for our iniquities. <clears throat> the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God Almighty cannot take stripes. God cannot be whipped. Is a spirit. God cannot shed blood. God cannot be pierced. Brothers and sisters, but God could provide the means, could pro pro provide that human vessel of clay that can willingly say, I will take the whipping on their behalf. I will be nailed on their behalf. I will shed my blood as a ransom for their sins. Brothers and sisters, we have to realize when Jesus died, it was that pure, sinless life that God placed in the human vessel of clay. Brothers and sisters, that when the blood went out, the life went out as well. God did not die. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, died. And my brothers and sisters, he was the means so that you can say, Lord, another person gave his life for me. So when we read all of this, we've got to understand. But he, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. Uh, Jesus was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Look at the word bruised used there. Genesis 3.15 uses that word, brothers and sisters. He shall bruise the head of the serpent and he shall bruise his heel. <clears throat> that is it, brothers and sisters. No better picture to be able to show you. Brothers and sisters, when they put him at the whipping post and they beat him till he fell. The scriptures may not say that, but brothers and sisters, no man can just take that, I would say, with all the strength that he has. But brothers and sisters, Isaiah saw this picture some 700 years before it could happen. And my brothers and sisters, uh, Jesus Christ willingly gave his back. The Bible says, I gave my back and they made furrows upon it. Brothers and sisters, uh, they, he wasn't forced to take that whippings. And in that hand of, I would say those soldiers, was brothers and sisters, those whips that pulled out flesh out of the back of Jesus Christ. But brothers and sisters, we have to realize when we look at the prophecies that are in the scriptures, they all line up because brothers and sisters, that is what it was destined to be. All we like <clears throat> sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. Brothers and sisters, you can go to <clears throat> the greatest uh, church leader, the greatest president of this world and say, I bring my case, I bring my sin. You cannot lay it <coughs> anywhere. Your sin was laid on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says, the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He took, brothers and sisters, that sinful uh, nature upon I would say himself, the Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin, so that we can have the righteousness of God. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. <coughs> he was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before a shearer is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Brothers, 
Can you imagine a man that stands there and accepts everything that they do to him to brutalize him and he never opened his mouth? What a child this was. Brothers and sisters, sir, that an angel announced his birth. And my brothers and sisters, sir, nine months, he was in the womb of Mary. The Bible says when the fullness of time came, she brought forth, brothers and sisters, and for 12 years he grew up. And my brothers and sisters, in the 12th year, brothers and sisters, his mother and father takes him to the feast in Jerusalem. And my brothers and sisters, in, I would say, everything that goes on, they forgot and left him in the temple. The Bible says they didn't leave him there for 24 hours. They left him for three days. Brothers and sisters, a 12-year-old boy talking with the scribes and the Pharisees for three days. And then when they came to him and said, we've looked every way. Do you know what heartache you brought to us? He said, shouldn't I be about my father's business? Brothers and sisters, at 12 years old, he knew more than all those Pharisees and Sadducees ever knew. But brothers and sisters, he knew what he was <laughs> destined for. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. What was the pleasure of the Lord? Brothers and sisters, sir, do you think it was pleasurable for God to see his only begotten son was so obedient to be masked and brutalized? The father had a plan before the foundation of the world. The plan was, how will I be able to save my lost sons and daughters? And there was no angel that could do it. He couldn't do it. And my brothers, he saw before the foundation of the world that there was one son that was willing if he was given the opportunity that he will be able to fulfill the pleasure, the will, the, I would say, the plan of the Father. That is why the Bible says, the Lord shall prosper, or, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Brothers and sisters, if a father has a plan, let's say to build a great empire, but he thinks, well, if I give it to this architect, he may do something. I give it to this builder, and that contractor will do something. I give it to this. But then finally, brothers and sisters, out of his own womb, uh, I would say, lineage, comes a son. The brothers and sisters uh, who has the potential to be a builder and a contractor. Brothers and sisters, uh, the father would say, this son is going to fulfill my pleasure. That's what it say, means there. That Jesus Christ was to fulfill his father's will. <clears throat> he, shall see, he shall see of the travail of his soul. And shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear the iniquities. Bear their iniquities. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, through his blood has justified us. When that happened on Calvary, brothers and sisters, as we had said on Wednesday... Brothers and sisters, the veil was rent. What did it mean? Through that veil, when he said it is finished on Calvary, brothers and sisters, the curtain was torn from the top to the bottom. The old covenant had come to an end in the sense that Christ had fulfilled everything concerning salvation. And now we don't have to come through, brothers and sisters, all these things that are in the tabernacle. We can come through the blood of Jesus Christ and we can talk to God. My brothers and sisters, he was crucified, he was placed in a tomb, and on the third day he rose from the grave. Brothers and sisters, sir, the devil cannot push these scenes back. It's accomplished, it's finished. And my brothers and sisters, sir, that is why Paul could say, For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. God's plan is not haphazard. That is why the religious world today say, but brother, why do you all waste so much of time talking about this and talking about that, talking about that? Brothers and sisters, uh, 
It's not to be able to make bookworm other people. But it is to be able to give a people a foundation to rest their faith upon. Because if you don't have anything to rest your faith upon, you have a blank faith. You're just going by emotion. But when the Bible says uh, every man in his each, every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, he was the first man to rise from the dead. Brothers and sisters, afterward, <clears throat> they that are Christ at his coming. My brothers and sisters, that shows the order of it. Quickly, as you see this chart, brothers and sisters, we see here uh, that at this point, the prehistoric age was in existence. Lucifer, brothers and sisters, the murderous spirit that caused brothers and sisters a judgment to start there. Brothers and sisters, God made the earth void and shifted the earth away from the sun, which started the ice age. Brothers and sisters, after a long period of time, God's pleasure that he was going to bring a man on earth and a woman that will bring forth his family. Brothers and sisters of sons and daughters, that God may not be a lonesome God. Because brothers and sisters, remember, if God existed the way he was from eternity, it would be a very lonesome thing. Though he is a God that is independent, but he had a nature to share himself with other offsprings. But brothers and sisters, he made the angelic kingdom, and we know that that was judged there. But through seven dispensations of time, brothers and sisters, 7,000 years, God began to renew this earth before he put Adam and Eve, brothers and sisters, on this earth. And the short while that they lived, <coughs> brothers and sisters, they disobeyed God. And we know, brothers and sisters, that brought about the fall and that brought about the sin that every child that comes into this world is born in. Brothers and sisters, if Adam and Eve listened to God, Adam would have had eternal life in him. Eve would have had eternal life within him, in her. When they came together at the right time, Eve would have supplied the egg that would have been minus of every, I would say, sinful thing and nature or genetic wise that would have been, she would have had a pure egg, brothers and sisters. Adam would have supplied that gem of life. And every child that would have been born would have been a child that would have had eternal life, brothers, just like the Lord Jesus Christ. But brothers and sisters, since they had, brothers and sisters, disobeyed God, mankind was lost. But brothers and sisters, as soon as Adam and Eve had done that, God said, brothers and sisters, that he would send the promised seed of the woman. Right there at the beginning, brothers and sisters, of the Garden of Eden, he said, uh, the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. Amen. Brothers and sisters, imagine, for 7,000 years, we're now living here, but brothers and sisters, the flood came, the law in types and shadows, brothers and sisters, pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ, but finally Jesus Christ came. He shed his innocent blood, Brothers and sisters, from year to year, there is not another person that you can ever lay your salvation upon. That is why, brothers and sisters, the birth of Jesus Christ is of such, mo I would say, uttermost importance. Because, brothers and sisters, it wasn't the birth of an ordinary child. It does not give salvation knowing when he was born, how he was born, salvation is in accepting what he did on Calvary. But nonetheless, brothers and sisters, it's important to know why he came through a virgin. Because, brothers and sisters, that tells us that, brothers and sisters, uh, his vessel of clay had sinless, pure blood that you can have and rest your salvation upon. Brothers and sisters, so we'll take up this <coughs> maybe in other services, but... The Bible says, for he must reign till he had put all enemies under his feet. For he, 
hath put all things under his feet. For when he saith, this other verse, for he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith, all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted. Now, if there's anyone believes that Jesus Christ was God, this scripture to tell them that God was never put under the feet of Jesus Christ. God will never be put under his feet. The Bible says, brothers and sisters, uh, the chronological order, or I would say the order of the God it is, brothers and sisters, it's God, it's Christ, it's man, it's woman. Brothers and sisters, the world has turned it all around. But we see here, the Bible says, for he had put all things, who is the he? That is God, had put all things under his feet, under the feet of Jesus Christ. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is reasonable, it is understandable, it is manifested that he, that is God, is excluded, is accepted, which did put all things under him. That lets us know, brothers, all persons in the Trinity God that the world talks about, that they are all equal, how are they going to explain this scripture? That God will never give himself up to be put under any individual. But my brothers and sisters, God knew before the foundation of the world, man would never be able to know what God is like, would never be able to see his characteristics, will never be able to see how loving he is, how powerful he is, how, I would say, caring he is. My brothers and sisters, after 30 years of the birth of Jesus Christ, the Bible says that it pleased the Father that in him should dwell all the fullness of the Godhead. My brothers and sisters, that is why on the banks of the river Jordan, God came and indwelt his son. And my brothers and sisters, for three and a half years, the world had an opportunity to see God in a man. Brothers and sisters, they didn't see God uh, I would say as a man that was born in Bethlehem, it was God manifesting through a man, his only begotten son. When he done an healing, it was God doing the healing through Jesus Christ. Uh, but brothers and sisters, when you say that and then you take him up to Calvary, brothers and sisters, you have to understand, they did not took, I would say, <coughs> nails and poked it through God. Because God, brothers and sisters, is a spirit. But God was in Jesus Christ. The Son of God felt <laughs> all the pain. The Son of God, I would say, brothers and sisters, uh, felt the brutality because as a man, he took all your punishment that you're supposed to take. Brothers and sisters, I realize this morning, to you that are seated here, that hear this, you, you have to thank God. That God, as in this hour, clarified the scriptures to bring you to this hour because brothers and sisters if you was in the denominational world and you came brothers and sisters into the message of this hour the message of this hour they still take from brother Branham's teaching and they say well they quote him brothers and sisters uh, Jehovah cried in Bethlehem Jehovah crawled in Bethlehem now I don't say that derogatively brothers and sisters I know that we all believed in that line of thought one way or the other because there was no other explanation to it. We thought, well, that, that is what it is. God was uh, doing all of that. Brothers, it was the Son of God doing it. But then when God began to open certain scriptures, to be able to nail it down, to say that if you say God died, then God is eternal. And if God died, then God is not eternal. Brothers and sisters, and if you say God was born, then God had a beginning. Brothers and sisters, God did not have a beginning. The Son of God had a beginning. Brothers and sisters, and we can say that our salvation is based upon the fact that God, brothers and sisters, so loved the world that he gave a son that he created in the virgin womb of Mary. That whosoever believeth that that son paid the price for them shall be saved. 
My brothers and sisters, that is what salvation is all about. In you accepting the fact that our Heavenly Father saw our dilapidated condition and provided a little baby. Brothers and sisters, there was no other baby born in this universe like Jesus Christ. From the time of Eve, whether it was Abel, brothers and sisters, he still had a sin nature in him. The only baby that was born without a sinful nature. I tell you, Mary had an opportunity to embrace, brothers and sisters, the most, uh, I don't have the words to say, but the most beautiful, uh, willing, obedient, kind uh, little child. And my brothers and sisters, but when it came to following his father's will, he told his mother, shouldn't I be about my father's business? And that is why this son that was crucified on Calvary, brothers and sisters, when he looked down and he looked at John, he realized this mother had bore me. This mother had walked with me. And the prophecy that was given, even a sword will go through your, your soul. As she stood there and she looked at her son, in the sense she knew because she pondered the questions. She didn't know what was going to happen. He said, John, behold thy mother. In other words, he said, John, I'm going to be taken away for a short time. You now take care of her. Brothers and sisters, that is why I have to say this gospel is one of the most profound and beautiful scriptures. When you line them up in the word of God, they show you right from the starting, brothers and sisters, I would say, of time throughout the scriptures. There is no confusion. There is no question. Brothers and sisters, uh, there is a beautiful picture that God is... But this picture didn't come about, brothers and sisters, because it's all just put in the word of God. As I said, when you read uh, Isaiah chapter 9 and verses 1, that... That happens after the birth of Jesus Christ, but God just put it there. That's why God talks in parables. The wise and prudent of this world will say, well, brother, you know, anybody can draw the chart. Well, anybody can draw that. But brothers and sisters, it takes the Spirit of God to put it together. And if you just uh, duplicate it carnally in your mind, there will be no inspiration, there will be no joy. My brothers and sisters, what a joy it is to be living at this end time. And to know, brothers and sisters, there was a prehistoric age. Your mind can go right to the beginning of time. And know how this ice age came about. Why God didn't destroy Adam and Eve and gave an opportunity. And my brothers and sisters, through seven church ages, brothers and I would say seven dispensations of time, Jesus Christ is coming back again. But when this child comes back again, the Son of God is not coming back as a child in a manger. He's coming back invested with the authority to be King of kings and Lord of lords. Out of his mouth goat a sword to be able to destroy this world. And my brothers and sisters, that is why you and I can thank God. This season, as they say, has a reason. What is the reason of this season? It's not, brothers and sisters, just a Christmas tree. It's just not a star. It's just not toys. But if you catch the understanding of it, all of those things can be, I would say, things that will point you to something that points to Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, he was the bright and morning star. <laughs> Having a fake star means nothing. The star has to come inside your life. He was the tree of life, not a Christmas tree. That if it points to the tree of life, praise be to God. Brothers and sisters, it's an occasion for joy. Because brothers and sisters, when Jesus was born, it was not silent night being sung. The Bible tells me, brothers and sisters, uh, the angels came down. What an anthem was sung. What a joy was given. It was the loudest no night that I would think about. That the world was all fast asleep. But they sing this, the sweet carols and the silent night. And, and brothers and sisters, 
I am not saying anything about that. But I'm saying when you have a revelation, you can have joy at this occasion. You can have and, and you can enjoy yourself. That brothers and sisters, your Savior was born. And you can see that he was the only one that you can honor and praise because there was nobody else like him. Brothers and sisters, so I'm thankful to God that at this hour we can have a clarity of picture inside our hearts. Let's stand to our feet today. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful that at this hour of time, Lord, you can paint a picture in our hearts. Lord, a picture that this world has discarded. A picture that the world doesn't want. But I pray this day, my God, help your people, guide them along this way. Lord, take these words. Lord, I pray you be the one that creates the picture inside their soul. Let them see, dear God, that almost 2,000 years ago, a child was born. A child that was destined to be our savior. A child that was destined to die for the sins of the world. A child, brothers and sisters, that Lord you alone has given. Dear God, a way back to God. I pray, Lord, that you'll help every child to realize the importance of this hour of time and season, Lord. And Lord, I pray that they will make the best of it. We ask these mercies in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. While we sing a song, if you have a need, you come forward today. Amen. How big is God? How big and vast is vast to me? To begin to tell, these lips can only try. Is big enough? To rule this mighty universe Yet small enough To dwell within my heart How big is God? How big and wide is vast to me To begin to tell These lips can only try is big enough to rule this mighty universe yet small enough to dwell within my heart how big is god how big and wide is vast domain to begin to tell these lips can only try is big enough to rule this mighty universe yet small enough to dwell within my heart how big is God big and wide is vast domain to begin to tell, these lips can only try. Is big enough to rule this mighty universe, yet small enough to dwell within my heart? How big is God? How big and wide is vast domain To begin to tell These lips can only try Is big enough To rule this mighty universe Yet small enough To dwell within my heart